<laughs> Hello and <laughs> welcome to another jam-packed episode of My Favorite Conservative. I am the Stoic Edward. Oh, and I am Andrea, and I am not conservative. I no. do have the giggles, though. You do. I do. Uh, but he is, Edward is, my favorite conservative. Oh, thank you. Yes. Now, we are not live today because we're traveling again. Mm -hmm. We do have actual jobs, so that's why we're not here live. But we are recording a show for you a couple days in advance because it's a topic we feel very strongly about, both of us, that we're on the same page about and one that we feel will have a huge impact on the upcoming presidential election. Yeah, you are correct as always. You don't want to repeat that? No, just speak you're, up. You are correct as always. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, I missed that part. Okay, what are we talking about? We're going to talk about illegal immigration, more specifically about how to return all the illegals to their home countries. Okay, so I thought, I don't know if this is a Biden thing or not, but I thought all illegals that we've let in get to stay here into their quote unquote asylum court date? Well, technically, no. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. But because Tell according, me more. according to the UN, uh, their charter on claiming asylum, right? You must claim asylum in the closest safe air quote country to the country that you're leaving. So, okay. So what does that, how does that impact the U S well, let's look at our borders. Okay. We have on our borders, Mexico. Yes. Canada, and the only other country that is closest to us with nobody even closer is the Bahamas. <laughs> so okay. you're saying that Mexicans, Canadians, I don't know why Canadians Bahamians. would, but, and um, Bahamians, Bahamians, Bahamians mm -hmm. can claim legal asylum in the U.S. They can, because we would be the first, sa the safest first country closest to them. What about Cuba? Cuba, actually, it, I actually had to look this up, but no, Jamaica is actually a few miles closer oh. to, Cuba, to Cuba. Hear that? So Cubans yes. go to Jamaica. Yeah, go to um, Jamaica. Yeah. Uh, but that's not, so, that's not the reality. That's not what's happening. It, it's not, unfortunately. But the law says that this is the way you claim asylum. Okay, so, anybody, I like this. so anybody that showed up at our borders and said, asylum, asylum, that, they just know that word, right? Because right. that's been passed around. Yes. Well, unless you are from Mexico you should be immediately denied. So. Or Bahamas. Or, or the Bahamas Canada. or Canada. Yeah, right. we got a lot of Canadians coming down. Yeah, yeah. so many. Um, well, so I don't blame them, by the way. With let's Trudeau. talk numbers and different scenarios, because okay. I know you put a lot of thought in this. Yeah, okay. So um, we're going to have in our show uh, a link to our good friend, Andrea Whitberg over at The American Thinker. She's a great writer as reference to some of these stats that okay. we have out and there. Okay, in our show so, notes, yes. Yeah, but I think the first thing we need to do is change the wording, because words mean things. Words are as a, important. As a writer, you know, yes. I agree with yeah, you. You're a writer. Words actually, words fucking actually mean things. Yes. So, shockingly, they do. And what I am really pushing is we don't want this to be about deporting, the okay. deportation of illegals. We're not. We're repatriating them to their countries. Okay. So we, we need to repatriate because they are patriots from where they once came. Once came. Okay. And that is the proper term that we should use. Have we ever done this in our past? We have indeed. I mean, what's what's fascinating is back in 1954, which would have been in the uh, Eisenhower administration, we had what was very politically incorrect Operation Wetback. It was actually called that? Called Operation Wetback. Whoa. Okay. We sent back over 1 million illegals back to Mexico. Okay. Yeah, Mexicans. But what was interesting is Mexico was actually wanting them back. They wanted to work with us on this program because we really need that. Well, they were losing so much money right. uh, from these workers leaving and they wanted them back. So, you know, the actual Hispanic population at that time in 1954 was only 9 million people. Wow. Today it's about 80 or 90 million people. Right. So yeah, it's a huge percentage of what was uh, of the Hispanic uh, population that was actually sent back. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Okay. So that was 1954. Yeah. Are there any countries today that are doing a similar thing? Hopefully it's not called Operation Wetback, <laughs> but any other countries doing repatriation? Yeah. I mean, Pakistan right now, or as Obama would say, Pakistan, uh, they are actually deporting millions of Afghans, Afghanis, I guess you call them, yeah. uh, back to Afghanistan. They 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 can't handle them. 
they're tired of the unrest that they're bringing and they're not mixing very well with the actual local community so they are in the process of literally so people are doing this and they absolutely. can't be the only country doing this um that we i mean in, on a go. large scale basis probably yeah but you know our our country for all the whining and complaining we have the most liberal laws of immigration, immigration. Oh, than, God, yes. than, than any country any in the country. world and we've talked about australia yeah. on a previous by, by episode far. yeah yes. so um so okay so if we did this repatriation today how how do we go about doing this well you know i'm sure i don't have at my fingertips the laws that are currently on the books that we could use uh, leave that for the lawyers because lawyers got a lawyer right <laughs> but I, i'm sure a president trump uh would would be happy to use executive orders okay uh since mr biden has kind of set the record for how many executive orders you can use so right uh you know Unfortunately, the Dems will go full lawfare on them, uh, on him, uh, which is lawfare is just think warfare, just with the law, which is what they're doing to him now right, of absolutely. trying to break him with every lawsuit you can imagine. And they're trying to do that to anybody who supports him. They will go full lawfare on this thing. Now, whether his executive orders can supersede that, I don't know, but okay. we have to have a plan. It's okay. So I do want to ask you about and I don't know who, who dubbed this term anchor babies, but, and, and, and most countries don't allow this, but in the U S if you have a child born here in the U S it allows you as the, I don't know if it's both parents, but definitely the mother of the child to claim asylum, stay in the U S because you have an anchor baby. And so, um, and I know other countries do not permit this many other Western countries and, um, that are otherwise similar to the U S so what do we do about illegals coming to the U.S. with the sole purpose of having a baby so they can stay? Yeah, well, first off, we need some political will because we have to change. I, I can't remember what amendment it is to the Constitution, uh, what number it is, but it was originally put in the Constitution as an amendment because of slavery mm. that people were brought here against their, their will, will as slaves. <laughs> as slaves. And they should have been allowed to stay with their babies being automatic American citizens. Okay, that That's how sense. this came about. This is not people who invaded your country. And yeah. somehow we need to get that change. That has so to be So what could we do? I mean, I know you have some ideas about what can we do with, with the anchor babies. The well, yeah. Are. And unfortunately, you go to any big city now and you're going to see little four foot eight women, right? They're all about the height, right? All from Central, South, uh, Mexico, Middle America. Tend to be shorter, Central and I'm America, on the shorter yeah. side as well. So continue. But we'll let that seeing, slide. You are seeing them fully pregnant right now. They oh, are right, having sure. babies like you cannot believe. Right, because right. they'll allow them to stay here. So yeah. what do we do about so that? So what do we do? Well, I would propose. Okay. This, these are my proposals here that hopefully these our are RNC Edwards can proposals. take up. All right. But they can leave them here with a legal family member, but okay. they themselves would have to go back. Okay. They can put them up for adoption if they so choose, uh, which is obviously you don't want that. But if that's the only way that they decide that that's the best life for their child, then they yeah. should do that because we have many, many, many couples who are waiting who, years to adopt children and yes. they got to go to China and everything else. So, yeah, actually, or they can take them back with them. Yeah. And at any point during this child's life, they can come back to the U.S., whether if they find a family member or a sponsor that wants to have them here, they can. And when that child turns 18, they would legally have the right to bring their family members back in. Oh, yeah, that's in. a great point. Right. Yeah, so, that's a great point. Okay. But, our, you know, and that to me would prove that that you're willing to wait yes. this time and not try to abuse the system that you are willing to put in the hard work that it takes to. I, I don't know if they're abusing the system because it is a law in our books, you know, they're taking advantage of it, but I don't well, know if it's abuse. But... Well, I, I think it's a combination. There. Okay. So. Well, I have two examples that I want to cite and I'm changing okay. the names of people. So one is, um, this is a former girlfriend of a friend of mine. We'll call her Pam. Very interesting young lady, very intelligent. Um, lives uh, and was raised in Tijuana and actually worked for a company based out of San Diego. And for those of you who don't know geography, that's a pretty short trip from Tijuana to San Diego. It's right across the border. Um, now, it was very interesting because of the company she worked for and the health insurance she had. She did co go to San Diego to have her child. She wanted her, 
her child to be born an American citizen. However, she herself had no desire to move to America. And, and it's kind of interesting because it falls in line with this policy you're, you're um, suggesting. She, you know, she went back to Tijuana with her child, is raising her daughter there. But her whole point was she wanted her daughter to have the opportunities. So her daughter can come to the U.S. at any time. And if I had to guess, she probably is going to send her daughter to college in the U.S. Um, but it's interesting because you if you think back, she sort of could have been an anchor baby, but no, her whole purpose was my daughter's an American citizen and I'm able to do this, but I am raising her in Tijuana. So that is totally legal what she did. Um, and then I know on the flip side, when I worked at a research study at UCLA, I, I remember this one woman, I'll call her Mara. She was so, so delightful, but she was here in the US illegally. And I didn't know until it came up in conversation that she brought her son over illegally. And so he he wasn't. Her second son was born in, in the US. And so she had one son who was completely illegal and one son who was an American citizen. And when her mother died and she went back to Mexico, she really feared getting back, and this was during uh, George W. Bush uh, era, she feared getting back in the US. But my whole, the whole time I knew this woman for three years, I kept thinking, what are you going to do about your older son? What are you going to do? He's not legal. He wasn't born here. He's not an anchor baby. He doesn't have a social security number. What are you going to do about him? And, and of course, I couldn't ask her that, but it, God, it just boggled my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's always, there's nothing easy about this at all. No. I mean, it's, you know, ripping families apart. And that's the, that's the whole where leadership's going to come in where you have to have the cojones to take the slings and arrows they're going to be shot at you. Yeah. But I like I do like this idea um before we get into other mm -hmm. uh immigration policy recommendations. I do like this idea that if you come here illegally and you're pregnant, here are your options. Leave your child with legal family, give your child up for adoption, go back to your country of origin and like Pam, the example I gave and then your child can come to the Ameri America whenever he or she chooses. Yeah. Yeah. So I really, I like that. Um, all right. So let's talk about some policy recommendations that if President Trump is elected, he could do right now. Okay. First day in office. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. And remember, he's only going to be a dictator for one day. Oh, remember okay. Please don't put that. <laughs> Get that God, started. Right? Okay. All right. Come on. So, all right. To me, my whole thought process on this is obviously you have to build a wall, right? But you have to turn them away at the border. Yeah. OK, yeah, there is no let's ship them into the country, give them 10 years or seven years or five years court date down the road yeah. and expect them to come back up. We, in fact, have them come. They apply at the border mm -hmm. for their asylum. Okay. OK, you then turn them around at our expense. We will fly them home. We will put them on buses home. We will pay for this and then. At that they will be given a court date in the future and they can come back at that point, but they cannot be put ahead of anybody who's already in line going for legal status. Okay. Going about it the proper way, I should say. Okay. That, that is applying through our embassies and all that stuff. But they they have to wait their time in line in their home country or their next safest country to them if, okay. if they are truly politically persecuted okay you can uh, and that's one thing we need to talk about threat of gangs and stuff is not asylum a, a si true asylum and the only way that the un recognizes it is if you are afraid for your life of political persecution right it cannot be because you live in an unsafe area that's right. there are a lot sorry unsafe but areas in the US. yeah a, a lot of in, in the world is a is a dangerous place okay i am the play-by-play -play person all right uh, so you left them some points out here. Yeah. Um, what happens if instead of waiting for their court date, they come back a second time? Well, this is a, a one of the things that a way to identify people besides fingerprints is DNA. And we were giving DNA tests at the border. Okay. Until Biden decided not to do so. Okay, because, but that doesn't answer my question. Right. But my point is, so if they try to return illegally during that time and we can check their DNA that says, boom, we, you've already tried, blah, 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 they're immediately sent back and they are banned from ever applying again. 
Okay. There's so no second chance. I want to recap your policy points. Please do. For any policymakers who are listening. Mm -hmm. And like you said, have the balls to actually do it. Um, so um, future President Trump, perhaps. Who the <laughs> fuck knows anymore? Um, so number one, turn them away at the border. Correct. Number two, on, at our cost, we would fly or bus them back to their home. Correct. Free of charge. We pay for it as citizens. We, three, give them a court date in the future, but... It can't be ahead of anyone going through legal channels. Correct. Four, they can return for their court date. Mm -hmm. Five, if that DNA policy is reinstated, and if they are caught a second time to re-entering the U.S. because we do have their DNA on file, they're banned for life. Amen. All right. Just 100%. I have to say, we don't agree on many things. <laughs> But I agree, and I'm, I am a little bit more of an isolationist for sure, because I think we need to take care of Americans first. I think this is an amazing policy. Well, what I find fascinating, in, and it's an anecdotal example, is right before we came on air, yeah, I got a text from your father. Oh, are you going to share it? No, okay. I don't have, but I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. But your father is left of center, shall Absolutely. we say? Absolutely, yes way left of center Wait, and he, he keeps going he keeps going left. farther and farther. Yes. Yeah, he <laughs> yes. was a reagan he was a reagan republican yeah. at one point yes. but out of the blue he had no idea what we were going to be talking about in this episode he wrote there's one thing that i can agree with with the republicans conservatives and that is we have to send illegals back to their home countries and i was hey, just, just, just men, shocked Dad. this is a person hey, that would jump me. from a building before voting for donald trump Okay. Yes, so, but don't plant that. No, well, not put, put that in there. So okay. yeah, um, that, that was funny. Uh, that was funny. Yes, it was like my dad like could read our minds or he something. Was. It was weird. Um, all right, so let's talk about actual numbers, math. Like, if if we were to do this, right. because you're going to get pushback and people who say, "Oh, it's not possible. We can't do it." How do we actually make this happen? Give yeah. us give us some numbers to kind of walk through slowly. Yeah. So I, as I was thinking about this show, that's one of the main concerns you have you can't get rid of 10 million people uh, to be impossible right and it's like well guess what let's look at the math okay. let's just let's just say a base of 10 million people okay all right 10 million people illegals illegals Illegal. correct okay. yeah, all right. okay. 10 million illegals i don't care what nationality you are what just, ethnicity whatever illegal. okay. illegals right all right okay in a four-year administration presidential administration presidential okay. administration and the reason i'm using that is you got to get it done during your administration or else right it could I go agree. haywire you have a thousand days of actual work. Okay. Right? That's 250 days a year for four years. Got it. Thousand days. So you have 10 million divided by a thousand days, meaning you have to do, you have to hold court hearings for 10,000 people a day. Okay. And you're thinking, oh boy, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Right? Okay. That is a lot. Right. I'll However, keep going. all right. So what we do is set up 200 courtrooms. Now they can be on the border. They can be remotely. Yeah, I like right? that. Yeah. You, can, you can get 200 judges that on a rotating basis that this is all they do for a number of years. You get 200 courtrooms. Each judge can hear 50 cases a day. That's 10,000 people a day. Okay. Okay. The numbers work. When, when somebody is denied, they are given, you have three days, you know, to show up and you're going out or you can be sent out immediately, whatever the policy is going to be. I really think Trump needs to hire you to do this, but <laughs> I'm not going to live in DC. So yeah, yeah, we can work remotely. So, <laughs> but yeah. And I, I mean, this one of the, brilliant. one of the great benefits of this is it actually frees up all these federal employees yes. that have been used for processing people at the border. I mean, they've even, they even have our U S air marshals. We don't have any air marshals on flights anymore, in case you didn't know. Yes. Because Biden took them to these processing centers to process people. And that is the only reason he hires more border agents is to process more people. So it would free up gazillions but of hours. Can I just say something about Please that? Do. I am kind of grateful that there are not any air marshals because... I had an issue with a plane and trying to get on after the doors were shut. And yeah, um, you should have been arrested. Yeah. If an air marshal, I mean, I didn't have drugs or anything like that, but if an air marshal had been on that flight, yeah, I might have been arrested. But there was no you air marshal. You might have been questioned. I would yes. have definitely have been questioned yes. because they, you know, I just want to say Jetway was open or Jetbridge was open. 
they they zipped my little whatever you call it uh the ticket on my phone like zinged it said welcome and then i ran down and the doors were shut and i had a tiny meltdown and basically <laughs> basically they couldn't take off till they opened the doors for me and they did so it worked so yes. yeah well, congratulations so, for that yeah yeah yes. <laughs> um and now on this uh last point you have and build the fucking wall right amen just, just amen. do it why okay remember walls don't work yeah right except when they you know do. you put them around the capital and you know things like that just remember our wall is to keep people out not to keep people in that's a free society. Good fences right? make good neighbors. They do. High fences make good neighbors. Absolutely. High yeah. fences? Yeah. I think that's it's it good fences. Uh, high fences. Oh. That's okay. Yes. But okay. Let, let's look Let's look at some more numbers. Okay. What is it going to cost to build a wall across the southern border? You know, when it was originally started, it, yes. they were talking about 20 to 25 billion. I'm saying it costs 30 billion. Sure. A drop in the bucket for our mm -hmm. multi-trillion dollar budget every year. So. Yes. But also comparing to the cost of illegals, like, can you give us that? Well, yeah. I mean, so what are the costs that illegals are costing us as a society? And we are looking at about a half a trillion dollars for these people because of all the social services that they're using up. We're talking, you know, health care, free health care, education. Yes. Do you know what this is doing to these school systems where they're having to hire? Because most of these people don't speak English. They're right. having to hire all these uh, translators and in people. multiple and, languages. Oh, yeah, not just Spanish. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And one of the interesting parts was, you know, when we talked earlier about 1954 with Operation Wetback, when Mexico wanted those people back, back then it wasn't easy to send money, right? To send That's money true. back home. Nowadays, there's apps right on your phone, Absolutely. right? You can send it. So Mexico was losing all of this money from all these in Mexicans the going north in the 50s. But now? Now, in 2023, the remittances sent home from people here in this country are $63 billion. Okay, I want you to clarify that. Illegals. Illegals, yes. Sent Illegals $63 sending billion their money back. back home. Correct. That could have been part of the U.S. economy. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this is money. You know, they're not paying income taxes. Right. If they are, that means they're using an illegal Social Security number, right? Yeah. <laughs> because they they're not allowed to be working like that with the, the social well, security. Well, in some number. cases they might not pay taxes because they don't make them enough money either. Well, they so. may, they get paid in cash yeah. a lot of times. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, that's yeah, a big that's, thing. That's, that's a major component of it. Yes. So, I mean, our $30 billion to build the wall is nothing. It is absolutely nothing. And So what is it going to take to get this done? Well, the bottom line is political will. That is the key. I think Donald Trump has the political will. I think he does to too. To do so. Yeah. And he knows he's going to be a one term president, yep. <laughs> this, a one other term president. And to give you a quick example of political will, um, Javier Malay, the new president of Argentina. Yeah. And Trump just met with him the other day, uh, or in fact, today, I think. But Javier Malay took over Argentina. It is was in an absolute mess. Yeah. And the first thing he did is they have 23 cabinet level departments. He cut that down to nine. He cut out all the crap. Good for him. Right. Good for him. In his, he's in his second month in office. By month two, they are now running a monthly surplus. That's so incredible. that is political will. And he has taken crap from everybody down there, but he Good knows what him. it takes. So political will is what it's going to take to do this. Do you guys, do you, do you have, have it? it? Do you yeah. have it? And yeah. if you'd like to hire Edward to be your border czar, <laughs> he would do a lot yeah. better job than Kamala. Let's well, that's it. called common sense. It's, yes. all it, it's all it is. I know. It's, I know. But these are some excellent points. They really are. Thank you. Um, Thank you to, very much. Yeah. We might have to detail them more in the show notes. Um, all right, so this we do have it this week in woke. We do, even though this is an evergreen episode, <laughs> so this might be a few weeks old. Um, you may have heard about it. Tell us, Edward, where do we get this one from? Well, let's first. I I hope your head doesn't explode. No, no. Tell us where we got it from before you tell us the title. <laughs> this is our our good friend Alex Parker over at RedState.com. Okay, so I, that's important. So we yes, can tag him. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Yes. All right. Go ahead. Headline. College clobbers anti-fatness oppression 
while the ableist practice of grading gets lipoed. It's a long but catchy headline. It is a, it is a catchy All right, headline. So tell us Let's go to the on. article. For spring 2024, the University of New Mexico, that's in Albuquerque, by the way. By the way, can you spell that? That's a tough one to spell. Actually, that's one of the few I can. Really? Uh-huh. Should I quiz you? A-L-B-U-E-R-Q-U-E, I think. Okay. Double check. <laughs> so in one. Albuquerque, they are offering a three-credit course uh, for on a societal scourge. The ailment anti-fatness. I think I left out a cue. I hate okay. that I did that. But anyway, okay. I'll okay. let you slide. Okay. okay. Evidently, the heavy situation oh, is one of social construction. You just had to throw puns in there, didn't yes, you? Yes, yeah, okay. a lot of puns in this. I love it. Okay, so I'm what is this guy. course called? Well, it, it actually, the, the course reads, Welcome to Introduction to Fat Studies. This course will consider the structural forces that construct fatness as problematic as diseased, gross, dirty, lazy, gluttonous, and other negative characteristics, thereby reinforcing anti-fatness. <laughs> we will explore the historical development of anti-fatness and its roots in colonialism <laughs> and discover how capitalism benefits from anti-fatness. Keep you are, you are holding your tongue so well. I know. Keep going. There's one more line about the course. The course, this course study will study the impacts anti-fatness has on fat people and people of all sizes and investigate how anti-fatness intersects with other forms of oppression. Okay. Um, before we get into why this is just complete bullshit... <laughs> Talk about the grading portion of it too, and then we'll talk about. Well, that. yeah. So the, the the guy writes the the professor at the end writes. You may notice that I am not grading on participation or attendance. I have chosen not to grade participation or attendance because I believe that doing so is ableist. All grading is ableist. Okay, I'm going to deconstruct that before we get back to this bullshit course. Okay? Shall we? All right. So first of all. A college professor not grading on participation or attendance <laughs> is very common. They grade based on tests, on merit, how well they did on exams, quizzes, reports, essays. I was a, a college TA, so and I was actually an adjunct professor. So not grading on participation or attendance, okay, means fucking nothing, all right? Um, and then it sounds like this professor, though, is not grading on anything. OK, Correct. yeah, it says I have not I have chosen not to grade on participation or attendance. Again, it sounds like you're not grading on anything because participation and attendance doesn't mean anything at the college level. It just I, it just doesn't. Right. But his last line of all grading is I can't. Ableist. I can't. Now, I can't. now, just for the for the viewers out there and the listeners, uh, ableism is. Uh, discrimination against an oppressed group. Okay. Yeah, and it's a made-up term. It's fucking social Correct. jargon. So this, all it is, is basically you, fat, obese people. I'm surprised they actually called it fatness, you know, instead of obesity or whatever. Because but they, they tried did because they wanted to include more people. I, they did. I, I guess. I, I think so. that was the inclusion. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. This feeds right into. This whole, who is this professor again? Do we have a name of this? I do not have. The, the oh, God, because I just yes, so want to so. slam them on. on <laughs> I didn't want to give them a shout out. So. OK, yeah. But so that's a good point. Fair point. OK, so this anti fatness, if you're going to call it that, is directly linked to the body positivity movement. And I, as I've said many times, I don't think people need to be all the same shape or sizes or anything. But if you flip this on its head, as you often say, if you turned it to the other and we did an anti thinness, you know, if we promoted anorexia as healthy, right. <laughs> people would lose their fucking minds. That's a good point. I know. Yeah. Thank you. It is unhealthy to be fat. It is unhealthy, especially to be obese and morbidly obese. Having an extra few pounds, not necessarily going to hurt you. And again, I'm not saying people need to be all shapes and sizes. My weight has varied by 40 pounds in adulthood. So I've been way too skinny and I've been a little too heavy. Um, but to say that there aren't risk at being overweight is 
ludicrous. Okay. And we're going to go down the list and then we're going to finish with the one I care about the most. And I can't believe he did this. I told him not to do this because I just lose, I, I just lose this, my mind. Yeah. This is, this so is one of your goals to okay. die on. Yeah. All right. So this is according to the CDC, um, all causes of death. Okay. So if you are overweight and again, let's say, let's use extremely fat, obese, um, you have what's called a comorbidity mm -hmm. It makes you, you know, more likely to die earlier. High blood pressure, hypertension, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease. This is really interesting. Osteoarthritis because of the breakdown of the cartilage and bone within a joint. I know someone I went to high school with who is three years younger than me, and she's had both knees replaced. And guess what? She used to be a ballet dancer. It wasn't from ballet. It's because she's obese. Sorry, won't say her name, but sorry, but it's true. Sleep apnea and breathing problems. Um, low quality of life, mental illness, such as clinical depression, anxiety, and mental disorders, um, and pain, like in difficulty with your body actually functioning. And the biggest one of all, and the one that, that I care so much about is cancer. Obesity is linked, directly linked to 13 different kinds of cancer. Bottom line, that is true. Look it up on the CDC. We're not making it up. We're not fat shaming anyone. All we're saying is it's not healthy. And all of these influencers, these plus size model influencers, and again, I'm not talking about women who back in the day, you know, you would call a size 12 or 14. No, I'm talking about women that, you know, are 80 to 100 pounds overweight. And they are these huge influencers on social media calling you out, Callie Thorpe. Um, you can't say that it's healthy. It is not healthy. Nope. It is absolutely not healthy. Now you as a 25 something year old right now, your health might be okay. But if you have a doctor who's telling you the truth, they're going to say to you at some point, this is going to be too much for your body. We as humans were never equipped to carry lots of extra weight in our bodies. Never, ever, ever. I can't believe you did this topic. Well, think back a couple of things. Think back years ago, decades ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, there weren't a lot of obese people because of the amount of work that we actually had to do. To, to get food. To, to, yes. Yeah, to get food. And, to, and we to, ate to, fresh food. Yeah. But I mean, we, you're talking a lot, we were a farming country yes. and a lot of things like that where people, they didn't eat high sugars, that sort of things like yeah, that. But, yeah. Yeah. Processed food and corn syrup will kill you. Yeah. But what I find the most fascinating about this in this particular time, now we're in 2024, we just went through a multi year pandemic. Yes, we did. That besides being elderly, obese, was the next biggest determinant of death. And yeah, if you, if God forbid you were elderly and obese. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you were and you a can much look that higher up. chance. We're not making that up. Yeah, so I mean, you're talking people that, that have a much higher propensity to succumb to these things. Yeah. And, you know, trust me, I understand if, if people are out there and they have injuries where, you know, they can't do anything, but you can always obviously control what you eat, that sort of yeah. thing. But there are exceptions and some people are just going to be obese regardless. No, 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 I, no, 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 that's not true. Okay. Okay. That's not true. You said people can control what they eat. That's one of the problems that's <laughs> not being addressed yeah. is that the, we have a food addiction problem. There are people yeah. addicted to food the way there are people addicted to coffee, to alcohol, to cigarettes, to drugs, but we don't look at food as overeating as an addiction because we do need food to survive. You just, the bottom line is you don't need that much food. Okay. You don't yeah. need that much food. And if you're turning to food and, and I, and I think, you know, there are people that will be very honest about this. If you're turning to food to fill some sort of emotional void or to conquer sadness, or it's called emotional eating for a reason, you're not eating because you're hungry or because your body needs the food in that moment, you're eating to get away, you know, to sort of, you know, run away from whatever it is that's making you sad or unhappy or causing anxiety. And, and let's, you know, be honest, the reality show, the, was it called the 600 pound? Oh, 600 pound life, 600 pound right. life <clears throat> that we used to watch, but just can't anymore. <laughs> uh, Dr. Now Nazardian. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
one of the things that he always does, and I, I really praise him for it, is he's very straightforward with people. It's like he, he'll just say, you're lying to me. You're not eating 1,200 calories a right. day. It's clear. You're not. <laughs> you gain 40 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing is he always makes sure that that, that these patients and, the, and these are, yeah, are typically five, 600 pounds and up. So morbidly obese. He always makes sure they get therapy. And every single time there has been some kind of physical or sexual abuse in their childhood. Yeah. And it's so devastating. But I mean, people are turning to food as a coping mechanism. Yeah. Well, I, I think those are obviously extreme examples, you know, with that. But a lot of people now are just, I mean, you know, we live here in the South. The, uh, the dietary uh, everything's issues cooked here. in butter and lard. Yeah, it is, and people have a sugar addiction. Yes, where, oh, absolutely. You know, Lord forbid you take away a Mountain Dew. Yes, you know, I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> so. And but but I just like I said, this upsets me so much, and and I I have been called out on this on LinkedIn. I've been called terrible names for speaking up about this, but my weight has fluctuated by. 40 pounds and I am not a big person. So like I said, I've been on extreme ends of this, you know, I've been on the end where, you know, someone called me a Holocaust survivor because I was so skinny and, and that was due to long COVID. And then I've been on the other end of it when I was younger, where, you know, I had many people ask how far along I was or how pregnant I was and I was not pregnant. And so I've been on that extreme end of it too. And so I, I know what it's like and being too heavy and being too thin, neither one is healthy. And I think the bottom line is stop, especially these pharmaceutical companies yes. from celebrating obesity. Oh, and they God. are. So please, stop. they are. It they... does nobody any good. Yes. Ozempic, you know, I'm just going to take Ozempic and I'll be healthy and everything will be yeah. great. No. So. All right. End of rant. Yes. God, please. <laughs> that was a fun one. I begged him, man. I begged him. Please don't put to be a. Uh, it's like a red handkerchief in front of a bull. I, it really out. is on this issue. It is. It is because I care because I care so much about and I work with cancer Indeed. patients, and um, and it really saddens me. I've had six family members die from five different kinds of cancer, and when it's so clear the link between obesity and thirteen different kinds of cancer, certainly not all cancers, but thirteen big ones, and and that tells me, guess what? That's highly preventable. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. Thank you for joining us today <laughs> in this pre-recorded episode that we did just for you. Please follow us live on social media platforms. We are live on most Sundays when we're not out of town like today at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, um, 1 p.m. Eastern. So, and when we stream live, it's on YouTube, Rumble, LinkedIn, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Facebook. And please, if you're on Rumble, start following our channel. We're definitely getting some YouTube subscribers, but also on Rumble, please. And if you're listening to the podcast, which always drops the next day, Monday morning, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast wherever you're available, wherever you're listening to the podcast right now. And um, learn more and do all these things on our website, myfavoriteconservative.show. That's myfavoriteconservative.show. So my question oh God. before we go, oh God, I'm how scared. long do we have to keep saying X formerly known as Twitter? I mean, not we, people in general. I think until they change. Oh, well, he did finally change the bird to the X. To the X. He did finally yeah. change that. Um, I don't know because people <laughs> still call it tweets yeah, and tweeting. So. Okay, so Just curious. Anybody knows, let me know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was it. <laughs> That's it. All, All right. right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.